Sam Mindra, welcome to uh, Tinge. Hi, Sam Mindra. How are you? My pleasure. My pleasure. Excellent. My pleasure to be with you once again, guys. Yeah, it's uh, almost four weeks since we talked last time. And that was just after the no very famous press conference of uh, FIFA president Gian Infantino. And today he held another press conference and it was a little bit different. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about what he said and what was the difference between last time we heard of him? Yeah, I, I think definitely was much more low key today. That was also the expectation after his rather bizarre and historic um, speech slash press conference on the eve of the tournament. Um, first of all, he came an hour late. He arrived an hour late at his own press conference following the meeting of the FIFA Council. But in a way, it was also symbolic because it was kind of trolling the press and, and showing the press that he doesn't really care about the press and the media. Um, so he was basically one hour late to his own press conference. And then he started with a few opening remarks, unsurprisingly calling this World Cup the best World Cup ever, um, summing up and listing a, a few figures uh, in terms of stadium attendance, in terms of tickets sold, um, to back up that claim, the best World Cup ever. No surprise there from in Infantino. But I think... Um, what stood out for me from this press conference, which, as I repeat, was much more low-key um, from what he said at the start of the tournament, there were three things that stood out for me. This was the first time in four weeks that Gianni Infantino interacted again with the media. Um, he's been going to all the matches, he's been singing karaoke at the FIFA hotel, he's been meeting dignitaries and heads of states, but he hasn't interacted with the media a single time um, during these four weeks. That's point one. Um, the second point, and he sort of slipped that in into his uh, opening remarks, is that he considers this his first term, which means that Kigali, where he will get re-elected, um, perhaps by acclamation even, um, will be his second term. Term. So when you think about that, it means that football and the global will probably be stuck with Gianni Infantino until 2031 because he's allowed to have three terms. Um, and it was always clear that from a legal point of view, Infantino was going to argue that when he took over um, in 2016, that that was not his first term. So he slipped that in into his opening remarks. I thought that was very remarkable. Um, football in that way is perhaps doomed um, with Infantino at the helm um, until 2031. Um, and then finally, the third point that I think stood out at this press conference was, um, as we all know, Qatar has received a lot of criticism as World Cup host, and rightly so. Um, but Infantino announced that the Club World Cup will be played in Morocco. He announced or he repeated his plans for an expanded Club World Cup in 2025. He also mentioned that he wants to launch a Women's Club World Cup, which he did in 2019, by the way. Um, but there were so few details on both men's and women's Club World Cups on how he, how he won conceived those tournaments. Um, but the point of, of talking about, you know, restructuring the calendar, playing bigger club World Cups, I think the point of all that, what I call calendar drivel, um, is to deflect away from the criticism here um, aimed at World Cup host Qatar, because all journalists are now, at least football journalists, are now talking about what's going to happen with the calendar. Um, but I think, given that this is the World Cup in Qatar, um, that's rather unimportant. Okay. Uh, you have been there now for almost four weeks, maybe more than four weeks, uh, and you have covered all aspects of this uh, World Cup. What do you remember most, if you would sum up? 
Um, if, yeah, that's one hell of a question, Andreas. Um, it has been very intense um, in terms of covering the tournament as a journalist, um, though it's very small. Um, so there are so many stories that you can cover, but there's only um, so much time. I think what I will remember most, and now perhaps this is a controversial point, is that in the end, um, all of this is a PR victory um, for Qatar, I think. Um, let's just think about the final here, for example. It's uh, Argentina versus France, Messi versus Mbappé, two marquee players um, who play for Paris Saint-Germain. Um, for some football journalists, it's a sort of dream final. But it's also a dream final for hosts Qatar because it's two players from PSG, a club they own. It's two players. Um, it's Messi, the best player for the last 20 years, up against perhaps his, you know, his, uh, the prince in waiting, Kylian Mbappé. So it's all part of the show. And Doha is all about the show. Um, wherever you go here, you walk into kitschy and glitchy five-star hotels. Um, you go to Villaggio, a mall where you can take a gondola. Um, you go to Lucille, um, where there is a Place Vendôme. Um, so everything here is, is, in a sense, a show. And what strikes me is that you get football fans from around the world, and they walk around West Bay, which is the skyline that you have seen on TV, and they look up to these skyscrapers. And most fans think it's brilliant. Um, and those skyscrapers are, in a way, a symbol of, of Qatar's um, riches. And, and it's, it's, I suppose it's human um, for a lot of people to be attracted by all that wealth and all, that, all those riches. And when you think about the actual topics on the ground, and that's Qatar's human rights records, it's the LGBT discrimination, obviously that's been pushed um, to the background um, because of the football, everyone is focusing on the football. But secondly, and more importantly, from a non-Western point of view, few people actually care. Um, South America doesn't care, Asia doesn't care, Africa thinks Qatar is great, and North America has a sort of vague idea of the problems here. Um, but overall, sadly, if you look at it from a non-Western point of view, I think this World Cup, sadly, is a, a major PR victory for Qatar. Um, and from their point of view, they are now a geopolitical player. And secondly, I think that through the World Cup, they've sort of gained security independence from big brother Saudi Arabia here, which is a part um, as to why they wanted to host this competition in in the first place. So I, I think that kind of stands out. It's all a show with the sort of fake elements that you get here everywhere. It's such topia between ultra rich and the very poor workers on the other side of the city. Um, but it's all part of, of the show and, and the world, sadly, the majority of the world seems to have received it very well. Okay, yeah, I know you have a very short time now. You have a lot to do in the last few days. One uh, last question. Uh, how has it been to work as a journalist during these four weeks? I know that you had very special experience uh, during the, one of the Iran matches. Can you tell us a little bit what, about, uh, what happened and how it has been to work as a journalist during this tournament? Yeah, obviously. Um, so at Iran USA, which was, I think, the political blockbuster game of, of the first round and one of the standout games of the tournament. Anyway, um, security was really tight because, you know, FIFA doesn't want any political messaging or protests in the stadium. Um, and at the same time, keep in mind that there are very close ties between Qatar and Iran's nation states. So they did not want anti regime protests targeting the regime in Iran at the stadium. And we were speaking to various Iranians um, in and around the stadium in the lead to that match. And there was this kind of um, tense, weird atmosphere because all Iranian fans were watching each other. Who is pro regime? Who is anti regime? Are there spies from the regime here? 
At one point, um, a colleague and I were talking to an Iranian fan from the diaspora, and she told us that at security, she had to show her bar um, so as to, you know, that's, so that security could make sure that there were no dissenting messages hidden in her underwear, basically. Um, that's how extreme um, it was. So we went to security to check um, and to see how tightly they were controlling everyone. So at, at a given moment, security um, confiscate a Persian flag from a girl uh, with her mother and her brother. Um, and a Persian flag is a symbol for the anti-regime protests in Iran. And the girl starts crying because her flag is confiscated. I take a photo of that moment and from that moment, security was on to me. Uh, police, basically, they asked me to delete the photo. I refused that. And then they basically detained me for 20 minutes, um, kept insisting that I must delete the photo, uh, which I did in the end. Uh, but it went straight to my delete folder um, so we could retrieve it there. But the larger point, obviously, was um, it shows that there is little press freedom in Qatar and the colleague who was with me from the Hindustan Times he tried to alert FIFA at that time um, but the security told him we have 500 cameras watching you um, and I think that kind of um, you know um, is a, a, a sort of that moment was a microcosm uh, for, for Qatar no press freedom and everywhere you go you are being monitored or they at least have the, the capability of surveilling and, and monitoring you. So that has made working in, in Qatar not always very easy. Um, now in the tournament, there are a lot of journalists. They do not have the power to track everyone. Um, but it is uh, definitely the case that Qatar for journalists in general is a, is a, is a difficult, very difficult place to work. Samindra, it seems like you have to leave the building now before they turn off the lights. So thank you for informing us about what <laughs> happened during these four weeks. And uh, good luck with the rest of the tournament and see you next time. My pleasure uh, to you guys as well and uh, good luck with, with the show. Thank you. Bye bye.